Good evening. I'm Elizabeth McLean, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the annual dinner on the 270th anniversary of the library company's first meeting. We're delighted that so many of our members and friends have turned out for this occasion, and I'm particularly pleased to acknowledge Meg Morton from the Fidelity Foundation, several members of the Drexel family, Victor Drexel, people like this kind of wave, Ed Biddle, Tony Biddle, Francis Gowan, and Francis Train. Two administrators from Drexel University, Carol Montgomery and Mark Greenberg, who are representing the university president, Constantine Papadakis, who unfortunately can't be with us tonight. We welcome all of you who are not yet part of the library company family, and we cordially invite you to consider joining the ranks of our members. Let me draw your attention to the booklet you found on your seat. An update on our capital and endowment campaign. The cover indicates that we're approaching the $8 million mark of our $10 million campaign, but in fact, I can now happily report to you that we've crossed the $8 million threshold thanks to the generous support of so many of you. In the booklet, you'll read more details about our spectacular acquisition of the Michael Zinman collection of early American imprints and about the progress we're making renovating the Cassatt House and transforming it into a residential research center. And here, thanks to our member Betsy Scott, who is here this evening, for giving us a handsome start to the furnishing thereof. We could use others. Well, these are exciting times for the library company, and we are grateful that you are all sharing in this excitement with us. And lest you think we deal only in esoterica, because our core collection is literally invaluable in, in early American imprints, I also call your attention to the op-ed article in today's Inquirer. It cites Sally Griffin's account of the yellow fever epidemic of 1793 using two contemporary accounts in our collection and drawing comparisons but with our present anthrax crisis. It ends advising us to take the best of the past and not repeat its mistakes. And where better to learn this le lesson than at the library company? So well, now, without further ado, let me turn the podium over to our librarian, John Van Horn, who will introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dan Rottenberg to you. He's an accomplished journalist and business writer with eight books and hundreds of articles to his credit over a career that now approaches 40 years. For about half that time, he has been pursuing an elusive subject, the most influential financier of the 19th century, who paradoxically tried to avoid the limelight. Anthony J. Drexel gave no interviews, destroyed most of his personal papers, and held no public offices. He seemed to prefer that others, particularly his protege and partner, J. Pierpont Morgan, received the credit for his innovations. Drexel's immense contribution to the nation has gone largely unrecognized until Dan Rottenberg's persistent efforts have documented the extent of that service. And Dan will shortly be describing to you uh, just what those contributions were. The library company has a great interest in the financial history of our nation. Most of you here tonight know that just over two years ago, we initiated a new program devoted to the study of early American economic history with the help of the Fidelity Foundation of Boston. We decided to stretch our definition of, of early a bit beyond its usual end around the mid-19th century in order to bring you a talk this evening on one of the seminal figures of later 19th century American financial history. And we have another reason to take an interest in Anthony J. Drexel, because we have an important connection with the Drexel firm. The library company's first building, which was constructed in the 1790s, was down at uh, just on Fifth Street, just south of Chestnut. 
And we vacated that building in 1880 in order to move to our new building, which had just been constructed on South Broad Street, the well-known Ridgeway Library Building. This is now the building that houses the Philadelphia uh, High School for the Creative and Performing Arts. When we put the Fifth Street building on the market, in 1880, the board directed that a respectable real estate broker offer it for sale at a price not less than $60,000. Just a month later, they authorized the agent to sell it for $50,000. But finding no buyer, we ended up leasing the building to the American News Company for $4,000 a year for uh, 10 years. Then in 1884, a special meeting of the directors was called to consider an offer which came seemingly out of the blue from Anthony J. Drexel of $105,000 in cash for the library building and an adjacent property that we owned. Needless to say, this offer was readily accepted. So Drexel was putting together a group of parcels uh, into a large lot on which he was planning to erect a new Drexel building. So our building came down to make way for the new Drexel Company uh, building. Anthony J. Drexel may not have been ostentatious in his person, but he was certainly extravagant in his buildings. In New York, he chose Wall Street as the site of that city's branch, and he commissioned an opulent building, the likes of which the financial district had never seen. Likewise, in Philadelphia, the Drexel building was a magnificent marble structure, considered by many to be the handsomest private banking building in the world. It had 398 rooms, a great many of the newfangled inventions called elevators, and at 11 stories, it was the tallest building in the city, uh, affording visitors to the rooftop pavilion panoramic views of Independence Square and the rest of the city. Within two years of its opening, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange took up quarters in the Drexel building, making Fifth and Chestnut the financial capital of Philadelphia. Alas, the Drexel building came down in the middle of the 19th century, when so much land around the State House was being cleared to make way for the new Independence National Historical Park and now occupying the site that once provided a home both to the library company and to the Drexel company is the Library of the American Philosophical Society. APS, a learned society founded like the library company by Benjamin Franklin, had elected Anthony J. Drexel to membership in 1892. And when they were designing their new library building in the 1950s, the society replicated the facade of the library company's building that used to occupy that same site from 1790 to 1880. So we come full circle. And now it is my privilege to introduce to you Dan Rottenberg. Thank you, John. Actually, uh, John mentioned that uh, the, the Drexel building at Fifth and Chestnut came down. He meant, he meant the 20th century, not the 19th century. Some of you probably remember it. It came down in 1956, I think, when uh, Independence, Hall, Independence Mall was, was uh, first opened. Uh, I was preparing my remarks for tonight, and John Van Horn assured me that the annual dinner of the Library Company of Philadelphia is the leading scholarly gathering on the East Coast. Uh, I just wanted to make sure of my audience here. Uh, is there anybody here tonight who can tell me the name of the founder of the first great American department store, John Wanamaker and Company? <laughs> anybody? <laughs> can anybody tell me the name of the founder, the great, the first great auto maker in America, the Ford Motor Company? Nobody? How about the great American bank of the 19th and 20th centuries, J.P. Morgan and Company? Any? Okay, this is obviously a very illustrious group. It is not J.P. Morgan. The founder of J.P. Morgan and Company was Anthony J. Drexel, uh, who also founded many other things that don't have his name on it on them either. It's a great honor for me to be here with such an illustrious group who obviously uh, know something that most other people don't know. A few years ago I asked the, found the chairman of Drexel University, who was himself uh, an investment banker, uh, if he knew who founded J.P. Morgan and Company, and he didn't. So you're, you're, uh, in, I'm in relatively rare company here. Uh, I want to 
return the compliment of bringing me here by taking you away from here, uh, let's all go back in time to a Wednesday afternoon in March of 1871, uh, March 8th to be exact, and let's remove ourselves 90 miles to the north to New York City. But this is not the world-beating New York City that uh, you and I have grown up to know. This is very much the little old New York of Edith Wharton's novels. In fact, this is before Edith Wharton's novels. Edith Wharton was only nine years old on this particular day. Uh, this is a very provincial town confined to the limits of Manhattan Island. Uh, there's certainly no World Trade Center, but uh, also there's no Empire State Building, there's no Rockefeller Center, uh, there's no Grand Central Station, Pennsylvania Station, there isn't even a Woolworth Building, there isn't a Flatiron Building, there isn't even the Brooklyn Bridge. I mean, there's nothing. We're talking a very sleepy town. Uh, on the surface, nothing seems to be going on on this particular Wednesday, March 8th of 1871. Uh, but beneath the surface, there's something very important happening. Uh, in this town, there is a financial community on Wall Street. But again, it's nothing like the Wall Street we know today. Uh, mostly it consists of a lot of very petty, grasping traders and speculators and they're operating in these little ramshackle three and four and five story walk-ups uh, which I can only describe to you as Dickensian uh, and in fact some of them date back from before Charles Dickens was born so here we are in New York it's 1871 we're on Wall Street let's take a peek inside one of these little buildings and there's a cramped two-room office at 53 Exchange Place. And we look in the window, and here we see a confused and depressed young banker who's going through the motions of conducting business. Uh, his name is John Pierpont Morgan. He's 33 years old, but this, he's nothing at all like the great J.P. Morgan that you and I have read about in books. He's, in fact, a profoundly uh, unhappy and unfulfilled young man. From his perspective, his whole life seems to be in shambles. Uh, his banking partnership is about to expire. Uh, he's obviously a bright and well-connected young man, but he's already been tarred on Wall Street with a reputation as someone who's very difficult, very brusque, very tough to work with, not popular at all. On top of that, he has all kinds of health problems. He's plagued by severe headaches, constant fatigue, insomnia, fainting spells. He's suffering from a rare skin condition that causes uh, eruptions in his skin and, and uh, makes his nose burst out in, in big red blotches. Uh, meanwhile, he's receiving letters regularly by mail from London from his father, who's constantly lecturing him about his la lapses in character. He really has no further use for money. He's making about $50,000 a year at a time when the vast majority of Americans are making less than $500 a year. And he has no real desire to continue in business. And he's already written his father that he plans to leave Wall Street and he's going to settle down and he's sort of going to live like an English squire. Maybe he'll raise some prized dogs or a herd of pedigreed cattle or something like that. Well, around 4.30 on this particular afternoon, J.P. Morgan emerges from his building with a suitcase in hand. He hails a horse-drawn carriage, which takes him about four or five blocks to the steam ferry at the foot of Liberty Street. <clears throat> Here he climbs aboard the five o'clock ferry, which takes him across the Hudson River to the Pennsylvania Railroad's immense depot in Jersey City. There was no railroad tunnel to New York at that time. And uh, this is a huge depot. It's the wonder of its age, full of ticket offices and waiting rooms and restaurants. And then there are 12 tracks with trains headed uh, north, south, east, everywhere but west. 
Here he boards a train that will deposit him that night at 8.45 p.m. at the Pennsylvania Railroad's new depot at 32nd and Market Street in Philadelphia. So that's a total trip of three hours and 45 minutes, which seems very long to you. In those days, everybody was very excited about this connection. Only uh, before the Civil War, it took twice as long, and within the memory of a lot of people, uh, it, it had once, uh, in the 1820s, taken 22 hours to get from Philadelphia to New York or back, and you had to change, change ferries and take a couple of trains. Why is J.P. Morgan making this trip to Philadelphia? Uh, he really doesn't know. All he knows is that two months earlier, he got a letter from his father, telling him that Anthony J. Drexel may want to see him about a certain matter. And six days ago, Morgan received a letter from Anthony Drexel himself, inviting him to come down for dinner at his mansion in West Philadelphia. Uh, one of Morgan's characteristics throughout his life is his unquestioning devotion to his father. So his father tells him to go see Anthony Drexel. He's going. Here he is on the train to Philadelphia, very unhappy man, but he's going to have dinner with this stranger he's never met before and to stay overnight at Anthony Drexel's home. Okay, let's shift now the same day. Let's shift down to Philadelphia. Let's look at J.P. Morgan's mysterious host. This is Anthony Drexel. He's 44 years old, 11 years older than Morgan. He's a bald, stout man. He's got medium height, ruddy skin, a heavy brown mustache, which is his principal characteristic. He's the driving force among three brothers who built a small family currency exchange into a influential private bank of tremendous reputed wealth Right now it has branches in New York and Paris. It's got an operation in Germany. It had branches at one time in Chicago and during the gold rush in San Francisco. Uh, the father of the three Drexel brothers, Francis Martin Drexel, was an Austrian artist who had fled Europe during the Napoleonic Wars when he was a teenager. Somehow he wound up in Philadelphia painting portraits he never quite made it as a portrait painter. He was competing, don't forget, with uh, some of the great painters of, of the day. Uh, ultimately, he gave up painting, and he opened his currency brokerage uh, on Third Street, which was then uh, Philadelphia's financial district that uh, it stretched from Walnut Street to Market Street. And this was 1838. Uh, Anthony Drexel, his middle son, went to work there a year later at the age of 13, and he's been working on Third Street ever since. Uh, Anthony Drexel is a very much a creature of habit, uh, so it's easy for us to imagine how he started this day in March of 1871. In the morning, he gets up at his mansion on 39th and Walnut Street. He's one of the first people to settle out in, in West Philadelphia. He gets up, it's, it's a nice day, comes out of his mansion and walks three miles into town to his office at 3rd and Chestnut. Uh, along the way, he stops at 22nd and Walnut Street to pick up his best friend, George W. Childs, who's the publisher of Philadelphia's leading newspaper, The Public Ledger, at, uh, at Childs' mansion. And together, these two old friends, and they're also business partners, proceed down Chestnut Street with such punctuality that shopkeepers are said to set their watches by the moment that these two men pass. Uh, and as he passes, he nods, waves to everybody very politely. Uh, in one sense, everybody in Philadelphia knows Anthony Drexel. Uh, in another sense, nobody knows him other than his best friend, Childs. Uh, as John Van Horn already mentioned, Anthony Drexel is a very private, self-effacing man. He goes out of his way to avoid the limelight. Now, for all of his apparent influence and power and wealth, Anthony Drexel has a problem. And the problem is that he is a banker, 
and bankers have to be where the money is. The money in the United States in those days was primarily concentrated in wealthy individuals in three cities, Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. But of those three, New York is far greater for its concentration of wealth than either Boston or Philadelphia. And the real money in the world is in London and Paris. Drexel has opened a, an office in Paris about four years before this, but he needs very much, he, he has this office in New York, he needs very much a really aggressive, driving, dynamic person to run his New York office. He also needs to establish some kind of banking connection in London. So he's got a plan here. He's going to put this young J.P. Morgan in charge of his New York office. And in the process, this is going to create an alliance for him with Morgan's father, Junius, in London. Junius Morgan is very interested to see this happen because he wants somebody to keep an eye on his troubled son, J.P. So here we are. It's, by now, it's, it's 8.30 p.m., the evening of March 8th, 1871. Anthony Drexel is in his carriage, waiting patiently at the West Philadelphia Depot for J.P. Morgan's train to arrive. Uh, what's going to happen? Well, remember, we're back on March 8th, 1871 now, so we don't have the benefit of hindsight. We haven't seen the script in advance. We don't know how this story is going to end. But we do know that Anthony Drexel is a instinctively a mentor. He's the kind of person who seems to make good things happen to anybody who crosses his path. <clears throat> With the support of Anthony Drexel, an obscure banker named Jay Cook has become uh, America's financial savior during the Civil War, uh, raising about $700 million for the Union cause. Uh, with Drexel's financial support, his closest friend George Childs has evolved from a penniless clerk into the celebrated proprietor of one of America's most respected newspapers. Again, that's the public ledger. And of course, you and I know now, today, in, in 2001, that Anthony Drexel is about to engineer an even more dramatic transformation within Pierpont Morgan himself. Uh, Morgan is about to meet the first businessman other than his father whom he could really admire and respect. <clears throat> Drexel didn't merely offer Morgan a job. He offered him 50% of the profits of the New York office. He offered him tremendous capital support. And then, as John mentioned, in 1873, he erected for Morgan a huge, magnificent, what was then a huge, magnificent seven-story building at the corner of Broad and Wall Streets, which towered over everything else in Wall Street. Uh, really, it was, the it was the World Trade Center of its day. And overnight, it really redefined the landscape of Wall Street and the psychology, the way people who worked on Wall Street thought about themselves and looked at each other. Anthony Drexel did all this for this confused and really uh, unhappy, underachieving young man, J.P. Morgan. Uh, you could say that Anthony Drexel demonstrated more confidence in Morgan's future than either Morgan himself felt or Morgan's father. And thanks to the remarkable chemistry generated by this relationship, we now know, as we're looking back from this date in 1871, that J.P. Morgan is not going to retire to a life of books and art collecting and grand tours of Europe, as he had planned. Uh, instead, over the next 40 years, uh, Morgan is going to build and expand America's great railroads. He's going to create the world's first modern corporations, U.S. Steel, International Harvester, several others. And he's going to impose some sense of order on the destructive forces of the market. 
For better or worse, from this moment on, uh, Morgan's name will become synonymous with America's transformation from a rural agricultural society into a modern industrial state. Uh, Anthony Drexel is about to change J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan is about to change the world. Now, in my book, uh, I tried to recreate this day, and I called it the day the world changed. And, of course, in the past two months, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, September 11th, uh, that was the day everything in the world changed. And, you know, very often we look back at the seminal events that we think are changing the world, and we always look back and there's some disaster. Either it's the attack on the World Trade Center, or it's the dropping of the first atomic bomb, or it's Pearl Harbor, or it's the great stock market crash of 1929, or it's... Uh, you tell me, the fall of Constantinople in 1453, whatever. It's always a disaster. It's always something everybody uh, knows about. But as I hope the scene that I've just painted for you demonstrates, the world is really changing every day in ways that we're not quite aware of. Uh, even as we go about our daily business, there are great things happening behind the scenes that we're not aware of. And in times like this year, when everything seems to be going wrong on the surface, uh, that strikes me as a very reassuring thought. Now, I've, I've brought copies of my book along, uh, and I'll be happy to answer questions and sign copies later for anyone who wants one. Uh, there's a table in the back there. Uh, but before I do, I wanted to leave you with uh, another thought. <clears throat> Anthony Drexel really exemplified the old adage that there's no limit to what a man can do if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. Uh, I, I think you've all heard this. I, I tried to find out who actually originally said this, and I tried to trace it down in all kinds of... Uh, source databases on the internet, and I, the, the best I could find was it was attributed to Ronald Reagan. <laughs> it's got to be older than that. And if it was Ronald Reagan, I guess it was one of his speech writers. But Anthony Drexel's success really stemmed from his willingness and even his eagerness to let the Morgans and, and others, like George Childs, take credit for whatever contributions he made. Uh, he tried to bury his own accomplishments, and so, as John has told you, uh, for that reason, it took me 23 years to piece his life together. It's not just Anthony Drexel's papers that are gone, incidentally. It's uh, that great Drexel building on Wall Street that John described. Uh, that's gone. Uh, Anthony Drexel's mansion at 39th and Walnut is gone. The four-story bank that the Drexels erected in 1854 on 3rd Street in what was then the Financial District. Uh, that was knocked down in 1976 for a parking lot. The 11-story bank, as John mentioned, that they built at 5th and Chestnut in 1888, uh, that was knocked down in 1956 for Independence Park. But after 23 years of searching for traces of Anthony Drexel, I am here to tell you that some things do survive if you search long enough. Uh, so I want to leave you with one other time trip. I've tried to take you on a time trip here. I want to uh, take you on one more that you can take yourself. And this is one of the wonderful things about Philadelphia. We don't have snow-capped mountains and we don't have uh, beaches and we don't have a sugar loaf mountain, but we do have wonderful built environment, much of which has preserved in spite of the fact that a, a lot of it has been torn down. Has anybody read the uh, novel, uh, it's Mark Halperin's novel, A Soldier of the Great War? A wonderful novel about uh, an Italian soldier in World War I who witnesses uh, an absolute atrocity to one of his loved ones. He sees it at a distance, and it just 
utterly devastates him, and he has to carry this memory through the whole war, and it gets at him so that he finally starts rationalizing in his own mind. He says, maybe what I saw with my own eyes didn't really happen. Maybe something else happened, and he starts constructing an alternative scenario, and sure enough, it turns out that scenario is, in fact, what happened. Wonderful book. I, I highly recommend it, and I really haven't given away uh, the best part of the plot. I had a similar experience like this when I was uh, working on this book. Uh, early in my research in the, in the 1970s, I was rounding up as many Drexel descendants as I could find, and one of them said to me, you know, the original Drexel building at uh, 34 South 3rd Street is still there, the, the bank building. And I got very excited, and I went down there, and of course I found this parking lot th that I just told you about. And I, like the soldier in this uh, novel, was totally devastated. I mean, how could they do this to me? How could they do this to posterity or the memory of the Drexels? And for several years I was beside myself, and then I started to stop and think, well, Francis Drexel opened his first currency exchange at 34 South 3rd Street in 1838. And then in 1854, the Drexels put up a new bank building at the same address, 34 South 3rd Street. And that's the building that was knocked down in 18, uh, 1976. So I said to myself, well, you know, if they put up a building at the same address, they must have been somewhere else for a couple of years while that new building was going up. So I said, there's got to be some trace of the Drexels left on 3rd Street. And I started going back to the old city directories. And sure enough, you know, each year up until 1854, they, would, they were listed at 34 South 3rd Street. And then all of a sudden, 1854, they're listed at 22 South 3rd Street. And for about three years, they're listed at 22 South 3rd Street. And then around 1857, they're listed back at 34 South 3rd Street again. So I figured, okay, this makes sense. They, they moved to another address for three years, and then they moved back into their new building. So very excited, I got on my bicycle, I went down to 3rd Street again. 22 South 3rd Street, it's an old church, it's, it's there. And it's now a restaurant, Some, I think it's, uh, what is it, Wichita Steaks, something like that. So uh, this could not possibly be the, the Drexel's office. And again, I was stymied. And then I came across a clipping from a Philadelphia newspaper, eight, January of 1854, describing the wonders of this new building that the Drexels have just opened. And the new building is at 22 South 3rd Street. But it's the same building that was torn down at 34 South 3rd Street in 1976. So I went over to the Historical Commission. I said, what's going on here? And they said, well, that's very easy to explain. In 1857, the street, street numbering system was changed. So all the buildings changed their numbers. So the building that was 22 is now 34. I said, oh, OK, fine. And then suddenly I said, well, wait a minute. If 22 became 34, and the Drexels were originally in a building at 34, what's that 34 building now? Well, they looked up, they have, a, they have a chart showing what the old addresses and the new addresses were, and they said, well, that building is now 48 South 3rd Street. So I looked up in the folder at the Historical Commission under 48 South 3rd Street, and sure enough, this is the building where Francis Martin Drexel opened his currency exchange in 1838. It was just a coincidence that their first two buildings both had the same address, 34 South 3rd. So lo and behold, here's this building that historians thought had been knocked down, and it's still there. And you can walk over there today, and I urge you all to do it. It's an incredible experience. It's four doors north of Chestnut Street. There is a shoe repair shop on the bottom floor. There are two little apartments on the second and third floor. It's a three-story house that has been, uh, it was totally gutted and renovated in the 1870s. 
and then it was gutted and renovated again in the 1970s. The only remnant left from Francis Martin Drexel's day is a curved dormer on the top of the uh, house. But if you take my book, there is a picture in this book of Third Street as it appeared in 1859, a photograph. Walk down there with this book and you will see that just about all the houses that are in that picture in 1859 are still there on Third Street right now. And take a walk into this little, it's about 14 feet wide, this little shoe repair shop. There is a Korean shoemaker in there. Doesn't speak a word of English. I walked in there very excited. I showed him this picture. I said, hey, look, this is, your, this is your store. He says, no, no, it's not me. He, he thought I was from the uh, immigration service, I think. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, uh, there's no trace of the old office inside there now. It's all been renovated. The, the counter where Anthony Drexel worked as a 13-year-old boy is uh, no longer there, and he used to sleep under the counter sometimes. His father would make him stay overnight and be the night watchman. But just go in there, look around, and say to yourself, this is where the Drexels got started, and 35 years later they were running the world. Then I want you to take a good look at this shoemaker. He's performing these repetitive and seemingly very trivial tasks. And remember, back in the 1830s, the Drexels were performing a lot of very trivial and repetitive tasks also. And then ask yourself, where will this shoemaker and his family be in 35 years from now? The point I'm trying to make is that somewhere on this planet, at this very moment, there are potential Anthony Drexels, potential J.P. Morgans, who are going to change the world for the better. And right now they're laboring in obscurity. They're waiting for some mentor or patron to call them to greatness. Uh, Anthony Drexel is no longer around to perform that task. So now it's up to you and me. And thank you. John says we have time for some questions. If, uh, if I may say, uh, C-SPAN is here taping the presentation this evening, and we do have time for questions, but we also have a, a microphone, a portable microphone, so if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand, and don't ask it until the microphone arrives uh, at your seat. Thanks. Yes. Building next door is that how? What is that connection with the? Yes, floor? good question. The Drexel Building right next door at uh, 15th and Walnut. That's uh, that was put up by Drexel and Company in 1927. They were in the the Drexel Building at Fifth and Chestnut from 1880, 1888, actually 1885 until 1927. They put that building up. It was. Uh, at 15th and Walnut, 1927, modeled after a Florentine palazzo. And of course, uh, wonderful timing. Two years later was the stock market crash. Uh, they didn't stay there very long. And Bill, were they, were they still there? Bill Boothby is here. Uh, they moved out in the very early 40s. Uh, Bill Boothby, who was with Drexel and Company uh, from 1946, says they moved out in the early 40s. And as you know, what is it now? It's a, it's a health club, I think. Right. Yeah. But that was, of course, long after... An Anthony Drexel died in 1893, so that was long after, after his day. What else? Yes, Val. 
The question was, what bridges were in existence in Philadelphia uh, between, the, the, between Philadelphia and Center City, uh, or between West Philadelphia and, and Center City? Uh, that, that's a good question. I know that the bridge across Walnut Street was there. Uh, the main reason that West Philadelphia started to be settled was that the trolley lines were extended out to uh, to West Philadelphia sometime in the 1850s. Don't forget, that's, that's when uh, the consolidation of the city really began. Uh, but Anthony Drexel was really, uh, he, he was, he, the, the idea in those days was you, you wanted to, uh, especially if you were a second generation uh, Im immigrant family, as the Drexels were, uh, you wanted to demonstrate that you were part of society. And uh, Anthony Drexel's father moved to Rittenhouse Square Anthony Drexel lived there for uh, a year or two, but then he decided, I don't need that. And he moved out to the 30, 39th and Walnut. He bought that entire block from 38th to 39th between Walnut and Locust, and subsequently built houses there for uh, four or five of his children. Uh, two of those houses survive. They're, they're now fraternity houses at the University of Pennsylvania. Yes. This is just a footnote to uh, the Third Street experience of Drexel & Co. because um, next door to uh, Drexel & Co. on Third Street to the north was the office of John C. Bullitt who was the lawyer for Anthony Drexel in the 1850s and thereafter and the founder of a firm today that bears the name through several mutations of Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath. And every time that Drexel moved, Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath logically moved in coordination so that when Drexel left Third Street, Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath moved uh, to erect a new building on Fourth Street uh, just uh, south of the Drexel building on Fifth Street. And when the Drexels moved again to Walnut Street, why Drinker, Biddle and Wreath, then known as Dixon, Beitler and McCooch, moved in coordination again uh, in the 1400 block of Walnut Street so that that marvelous syncopated development continued on until the middle of what we now reverently call the last century. And Bill Bullitt, or Bill Boothby will remember that uh, that relationship which we at the firm regarded as inevitable and all enduring ended uh, sometime in the late 60s or early 70s for reasons which uh, he and I still mourn today. You're, you're quite right. Uh, the Drexels were at 34 South 3rd Street. John Bullitt's office was at 32 South 3rd Street, right next door. Uh, you, you should remember in those days, there were no, no telephones. There, there was no telegraph even in the 1830s, 1840s. Uh, and of course, no uh, fax machines and no internet. So physical proximity was really important. And the, in those days, the, the, um, the great wholesaling houses were on Market Street. And all the merchants from the Midwest, from Illinois and Indiana and Ohio, about twice a year would come into Philadelphia to stock up on supplies for the next season. And they would bring with them the notes of their banks in Indiana or Illinois, which were really, it, it, it was sort of like if, if I were to give you uh, Italian money uh, right now, you probably wouldn't want it. So these guys would pay for their merchandise with these banknotes from, from uh, the West, and then the, the wholesaler on Market Street would go around the corner, he would go down 3rd Street to all these little currency exchanges and see who would buy these banknotes from him and who would give him the best price. So that's, that's the way the world was, and that's why the financial district was so small and, and so 
uh, compact in those days, and why, for the same reason, you had to have your lawyer right, right next door to you. Totally different world. Anyone else? Ah. <clears throat> Pretty bleak picture of the young J.P. Morgan. Why did Drexel pick him? Good question. Why? Why was Anthony Drexel so attracted to J.P. Morgan? Why? Why did he give him such a good deal? I think the the original attraction was Drexel wanted really wanted a partnership with Junius Morgan in London, and. On one of his trips to Europe, I mean, he, he had some kind of relationship with, with uh, Junius Morgan. They had known each other, I would say, for about 15 years. And Junius Morgan told him, I've got this problem with my son in New York. Drexel was saying, I've got this problem with my bank, with my office in New York. And the two of them sort of cooked up this, this arrangement together. Uh, I think Drexel got very ex Drexel started with this problem with his New York office. Then he realized, hey, I, the New York office is small potatoes compared to an alliance with a banker in London, because London is where the real money was. Just as now Americans are investing, let's say, in China. China is dependent on, on the, the dollars from, from American investors. America at that time was really dependent on the investments from the Britons and to a little lesser extent uh, the, the French and the Germans. So I think that was really the original hook. And then as Drexel got to know uh, Morgan in the next couple of months while they were setting up this office, uh, he came to realize and he became, Drexel became the greatest advocate for Morgan in with Morgan's father. So you have Drexel writing letters to Morgan's father saying, you know, your son is really pretty terrific uh, guy and you shouldn't be so hard on him. He's really, he's gonna be a first-rate businessman. Father never thought he would amount to anything. So I think that's, I think that's what happened. It, it wasn't really originally that uh, he was, he cared that much about J.P. Morgan, but he did care a lot about Junius Morgan in London. I see someone way in the back. <clears throat> I'm sorry. The relationship between this Drexel and Catherine Drexel. Good question. I'm glad you raised that. The relationship between Anthony Drexel and Mother Catherine Drexel, who is now Saint Catherine Drexel. This is one more case of a famous protege of Anthony Drexel. Mother Catherine Drexel was Anthony Drexel's niece. And she, her father died when she was about 25. Anthony Drexel became the, the executor of her estate, of her father's estate, and he became her really de facto guardian. There was a very close relationship between Anthony Drexel and Catherine Drexel. And uh, I'm sure you've all read about Mother Catherine. You've read about uh, how pious she was. You've read about how she gave up her fortune to uh, live in a convent on, I think, 41 cents a day. Uh, you, you know how she set up a network of uh, missions to educate blacks and Indians, which was unheard of in those days. This is 1889 we're talking about. I think what, what a lot of people don't realize is that the thing that really made Mother Catherine Drexel such a success was her tremendous uh, financial acumen and her entrepreneurial instincts. She was really the only member of that third generation of Drexels who had any interest in business. And Anthony Drexel was, a, as I said, a natural mentor. So he taught her about bonds. He taught her about how to set up a business. And basically, the network of missions that she and schools that she set up was really modeled after the network of banks that he had set up. So I'm glad you asked that question because uh, that's something I didn't even get into in my remarks. But it's one more uh, support of the point I'm making, which was that Anthony Drexel made an awful lot of things happen that he never got credit for. Well, thank you. I am going to... Oh, wait, we have another? 
I'm sorry, we have another question. Dan, it's Tony Biddle. Hi, Tony. Hi. Uh, as Anthony J. Drexel Biddle, uh, I guess I'm a human example of the incestuousness of Philadelphia. Uh, here, here. And here we go. Yes. Uh, and uh, not only, uh, you know, the great institutions of Drexel and company, Bid Drinker, Biddle and Reese, and so on and so forth, uh, I want to say thanks to you for your long, lifelong dedication to this project. Thank you very much from the family. And uh, Anthony J. Drexel was my great, great, great grandfather. And uh, uh, I'm, you know, we have always been very proud of the family, very proud of what they've done. and frankly very proud of their willingness to not take credit but you thank you sir have given us uh, something in writing about all that and I do appreciate it thank you very very much Dan well thank you on that note I think I will adjourn to the back table there if anybody would like me to sign a book or to talk to me further, I'll, I'll be back there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. The evening is adjourned. <laughs>